This is a case of a 68-year-old woman with past history of multiple surgeries for midline, lateral and inguinal hernias. She had an omlay midline repair and the last lateral was operated by intraperitoneal mesh. The patient developed a big lateral recurrence and smaller midline hernia. In the CT scan we can observe both defects. We plan to make the reconstruction through midline approach by performing a retromuscular dissection on the right side and a Madrid posterior component separation on the left side. Immediately, we identified the midline sac that contains the previous onlay mesh, well integrated without showing tough adhesions to bowel. Then, we performed the reduction of contents on the lateral sac. At this level, we check the lateral defect superior and lateral to the previous intraperitoneal mesh. After completing the adhesiolysis, we proceed to protect our visceral contents with a towel. The left retromuscular dissection was carried out under the rectus muscle to reach the ambivium finding some adhesions due to previous surgery. The next step, as part of the Madrid posterior component separation, is to preserve the posterior rectus sheath the upper third of the abdomen. We follow the protection of the midline preperitoneal fat and the fatty epigastric rhomboid to get into a layer between the peritoneum and the posterior rectus sheath. So, we do not incise medially the posterior rectus sheath. During the first 2 or 3 cm from midline we can walk completely preperitoneal, but we change to a pretransversalist plane more laterally as it is easier to injure the peritoneum at this area. So, we reach the Novitsky pretransversalis dissection without injury the posterior rectus sheath or the transversus abdominis muscle. We also make the retromuscular dissection on the right side. It is important to incise the posterior rectus sheath under the linea alba as close to the midline as possible, to get the most of both anterior and posterior rectus sheaths. Under arcuate line, it is important to get just over the peritoneum, leaving the fat attached to the inferior epigastric vessels. As the sac and the defect are just starting at this level, and in order to avoid any additional injury to neurovascular bundles, we decided to start the down to up posterior component separation. It is important to remember the landmarks of our dissection, arcuate line, Bogros space, posterior rectus sheath and neurovascular bundles. As it can be checked, the peritoneum was extremely thin here and easy to tear. We finally found our way with the combination of electrocautery and peanut dissection. Always bearing in mind that the sac is just inferior and lateral to this dissection. We prefer to perform the posterior component separation before going into the lateral defect, as the opening of the peritoneum could make very difficult our lateral release on the posterior rectus sheath. As soon as possible, we dissect laterally preperitoneal under the transversus abdominis to release tension on the peritoneum. We continued upwards to meet our medial incision on the peritoneum at the upper third. Here, we can see that we are about to join our pretransversalist dissection, superiorly, with the preperitoneal dissection, inferiorly. Only a few centimeters of the lateral release are left to complete the Madrid posterior component separation. Having completed the lateral release on the posterior rectus sheath, we extend laterally the dissection as far as the level of the posterior axillary line. On the right side, we also perform a Madrid retromuscular dissection. We also dissect here the preperitoneal dissection under the posterior rectus sheath in the upper third. More laterally, we then walk pretransversalis. Now, instead of cutting the posterior rectus sheet parallel to the linea alba, 
we incise transversely the posterior rectus sheath. This horizontal cut allows to get from a retromuscular layer to a preperitoneal layer. The dissection continues in the upper third of abdomen to reach the subphoid dissection joining both preperitoneal dissection on both sides under the intact posterior rectus sheath. We, then, come completely preperitoneal towards the inguinal area where we observe a strong fixation with permanent spiral tacks over the retroperitoneum. Here, it is important to have the left finger over the iliac vessels to protect them from this dissection. In order to remove the previous mesh, the dissection must be made trying to peel the mesh of any surrounding tissue. At the iliac area, it is very frequent to have to control the bleeding from the deep circumflex vessels, that are constant and run not too far away from the ilioinguinal nerve. A number of tacks had to be removed one by one, just unscrewing them. It is relevant to carry out the dissection peeling of the retroperitoneal fat attached to the mesh. Near the inferior epigastric vessels, we found some more dangerous tacks. We first suture control a branch from the mesh to the inferior epigastric vessels. Then, we decide to go ahead with a tack just touching the intima of the artery with the idea of ligating the vessels in case of bleeding. But, Fortunately, the tack was removed without any disturbing bleeding. We could finally remove the previous mesh. The retroinguinal dissection was completed to allow performing the stopa configuration of the mesh. The femoral vein was clearly identified during this dissection. We also decided to remove the remnants of the sac and to avoid seroma formation we placed a drain on the subcutaneous where the previous lateral sac was located. The closure of the lateral defect was made suturing the lateral borders of the oblique muscles and transversus abdominis to the border of the rectus muscle, in an attempt to reconstruct the injured semilunar line. We use long-term absorbable monofilament interrupted sutures. A stitch to the Cooper ligament will help to later fix the mesh. We close the defect of the lateral sac together with the posterior layer made of peritoneum and remnants of the posterior rectus sheath, using running sutures of absorbable monofilaments. We also use the fatty epigastric rhomboid fat to help closing the peritoneum in the upper third. Local anesthesia block is now infiltrated between transversus abdominis and internal oblique muscle. Here we show the limits of the overextended dissection obtained between the abdominal wall and the visceral sac. For this case, we chose a tissue ovine collange matrix reinforced with polypropylene. As we wanted to get enough retroperitoneal overlap at the iliac and inguinal area, we decided to shape the 40 times 25 cm mesh with a small folding to obtain the three-dimensional configuration. A stitch helped on this task. The only point of fixation is to the ipsilateral Cooper ligament. Then, we extended the mesh over the peritoneal sac making the Mexican taco or stopa configuration. The reinforced material used is a six layer with a smooth side that can be placed intraperitoneal. In this case, we left the visceral side over giving additional reinforcement to the peritoneum. We restored the linea alba with polypropylene suture including the previous well integrated onlay mesh. After placement a drain between the mesh and the abdominal wall, we closed the skin and closed vac therapy was maintained. The patient was discharged uneventfully on the sixth day, 
remaining completely asymptomatic.